Lisa Day morning breakfast session talking about something that's very, very critical as we continue to figure out how we're going to deal with health care in America and the world. We're talking about how we get innovation from the lab to patients, which is the true end game. So my job here is to welcome you, to thank you, say it's so wonderful that AstraZeneca could sponsor this, and also to introduce our, our host, Jeff Lieberman. Now, you'll see from the discussion and everything that's in the book that he is the host of Discovery Channel's Time War. He's pursuing a doctorate at MIT. He had, under that, he's actually done key things with developing and leading Cyberflora, which is a robotic flower garden that responds to people, as well as a robotic wearable suit that teaches motor skills. So it's very much a pleasure to have him host and lead this session. But I do want to tell you one other thing about Jeff, because Jeff and I had a conversation the other night, and I won't go into all the details that we talked about, but the thing that he said fascinates him the most is the study of human perceptions and how we can change the world. Being able to blend art and science in this way and bring it to, pa and bring it to patients is what we're going to be talking about today and also why Jeff is such a fabulous person to moderate this session. With that, Jeff. All right, thank you, Lisa. I'm going to, you know, after that intro, I'm going to just go right into it. She uh, gave you the overview of what we're going to talk about, which is how you take these initial discoveries that happen in a lab and get them into the patient's hands. I'm going to keep that as brief as possible because Alta's going to have to catch her flight in a couple minutes, so I'm just going to introduce Alta. We're going to get right into the discussion, and then I'll introduce the other speakers, and we'll open it up to questions. Alta Charo is the Warren Knowles Professor of Law and Bioethics at the University of Wisconsin Law and Medical Schools. She's a member of the Institute of Medicine and has served on the NAS Board of Life Science and IOM Board on Population Health, helping to draft reports on the FDA's drug safety population health, sorry, drug safety system, the ethics of transnational AIDS trials, preventing terrorist use of biotech research, and managing the smallpox vaccine program. She co-chairs the National Academy's Human Embryonic Stem Cell Research Committee and helped draft its national research guidelines. She was a member of the NIH Human Embryo Research Panel and President Clinton's National Bioethics Advisory Commission, and more recently served on the HHS Review for President Obama's transitional team. So let's just get right into the discussion, Alta, and uh, tell us how we get these discoveries in patients' hands. Thank you. I, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to just first apologize, because I am going to dash out to make sure I don't hold anybody else up on their shuttle. Um, I'm going to simply give you some basic background information for those that are not completely familiar with the way in which drugs actually get approved in the United States, because the FDA is alternately viewed as either a friend or a foe, depending on whether your main concern is speed or safety. And one of my frustrations in this field has been the perennial notion that there is a kind of zero-sum game between speed and safety, when in fact, done properly, they can be complementary and synergistic. Um, the FDA, uh, you should realize, is really more than anything else an agency that incentivizes industry to develop information. It does this by saying that if you are the first person there to present compelling information about the safety and effectiveness of a drug, in exchange you will have a period of exclusive rights to market that drug in the United States so that you can make a profit all of all of your extensive research and development investment. To make that persuasive case to them, though, takes a lot of time and a lot of money because you have to go through distinct phases of trials with human beings all carefully supervised through the FDA in a process of negotiation. Phase one trials are very, very small, and they're really looking just at the basic metabolism of the, <coughs> uh, of the pros prospective drug. Phase two, you're beginning to look at uh, safety and maybe a tiny little bit at efficacy. And phase three, where you really begin to get into the hundreds of patients, is where you're really beginning to look at whether or not a drug actually has the effect that you want. And it's important to understand that most drugs, the vast majority of drugs, some estimates run as high as 90% of drugs, will fail somewhere along this list of phases of trials, either because the side effects are too extreme, the drug can't be tolerated, or because it turns out not to be as effective as you might have thought. <clears throat> 
Now those clinical trials, in order to keep them as small and efficient as possible, tend to focus on people whose conditions are fairly well defined. If you're testing a, uh, for example, if you're testing a drug for eczema, you're going to want to have people that have eczema but not a whole host of other comorbidities that might confuse the data with regard to either the side effects or the effectiveness of the drug. So when you come to the FDA with your information about safety and efficacy, you're coming with information that is fundamentally based upon people whose conditions are probably simpler than the conditions that you'll find in the general population once that drug is marketed. And this is one of the major limitations of clinical trials. Even with this, however, clinical trials always have been very slow, and that led uh, a number of years ago to a process by which industry now actually pays a fee for FDA to be able to hire more reviewers to try to push that thing forward more quickly and work to deadlines. Um, there are groups that represent patients, for example, in particular those with terminal illnesses that have expressed extraordinary frustration with this process. Because from their perspective, if you have a serious or terminal or degenerative illness, you simply don't have time to wait. And from your perspective, the balance between benefit and risk still would suggest you ought to have access to the drug long before it's been proven to the satisfaction of the FDA that the benefits outweigh the risks for the general population. The most compelling of these groups was probably the Abigail Alliance, which formed uh, around uh, a girl who died before a drug that ultimately was approved um, for a particular condition, um, had a family member that started this, started this group and went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court trying to trying to persuade the court that buried in our Constitution was a right to life not related to abortion, but to access to drugs that have not yet been approved by the FDA. The assertion being that the government has no business telling people that they cannot purchase a drug that the FDA has not approved. They ultimately lost their case. They lost it for a lot of complicated reasons that would take too long to explain, but in some respects it was almost a, it was almost a futile case because it's, it assumed that manufacturers would be willing to scale up to produce these drugs in quantities sufficient to meet the demand from such patients without the manufacturers having any guarantee that in the long run they would indeed have a market for this drug once it was finally approved. But this gives you an idea of the kind of depth of frustration. The FDA has of course developed some ways for people to get access to drugs before they've been finally approved. Most people call them compassionate use protocols, although it's not the technical name. By and large, they're for single, or do single individuals or small numbers of people to get a drug on what is essentially an individual clinical trial protocol. Um, only in the case of AIDS did we see massive numbers of people getting drugs still at the unapproved stage through something called parallel track. And this has presented itself with a kind of fundamental public health challenge. If people, can get to, if people can get drugs in large numbers before they've gone through the full panoply of testing, then what incentive would remain for manufacturers to make that extraordinary investment in the clinical trial process to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the drug really is safe and effective? Essentially, the incentive would disappear. And we know these incentives are important because when we give people incentives, give pioneer companies incentives, we actually see them function well. Uh, for example, when you have drugs that have been approved for adults but we still don't know the, uh, pro the appropriate indication for children whose dosages may need to be completely different, we've seen that by extending the period of exclusive rights to market a drug, you can in fact incentivize to have more trials done in children. When you have drugs that would only be useful for a small population of people, so no business plan would support its R&D investment, Additional incentives in terms of extended exclusivity periods, again, would, would provide effective incentives to develop so-called <coughs> orphan drugs. So we know that there is this link between exclusive periods of marketing and the incentive to actually invest. Um, why did I say, by way of conclusion, that we can actually see speed and safety help one another? I think the key is in the post-marketing period. Up until very recently, the FDA had very limited authority outside of the bully pulpit to really force any kind of exploration of how these drugs function once they are out in the world. Out in the world where they're being used by populations that have much more complicated medical conditions, 
populations that are older and younger than the ones that were enrolled in the trials, and populations that are using the drugs for reasons different than the ones for which they were originally tested, so-called off-label use, a pattern that is perfectly legal, very common, particularly in pediatric and cancer populations, uh, where the prescribing practices are based upon academic articles and other kinds of anecdotal information, but they are not based upon clinical trial data that has been independently reviewed by the FDA, FDA as a neutral arbiter. Um, and in this post-marketing period, there's a lot of opportunity to learn more about a drug and to begin now, post-2007 amendments, to begin to make very uh, judicious changes in how the drug is sold, what kinds of special tests might be needed before somebody can get the drug, what kind of monitoring might be necessary to follow up on the drug, so that you could, in this pre-market approval period, take more chances, move drugs more quickly, even though you know that there are shortcomings in the clinical trial process, because there's a chance to back up and catch the problems later on in the post-market period. This would be the answer to something like the classic dilemma with Vioxx, where its pre-market testing looked pretty good, but out in the real world where its use among, for example, arthritic populations meant it was being used by populations that also had comorbidities that made them susceptible to heart disease, led to a difficult to detect but discernible, ultimately discernible uptick in heart disease among people using this. That's the kind of monitoring which, if done systematically, might let you be more confident the next time and not have the pendulum swing back to an extraordinarily conservative, risk-averse position in a post viox period. I apologize for running through this, but I don't want to keep anybody from getting to the airport on time. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I'm going to just sure you have time for one question walking out. All right, so let me introduce the uh, rest of the speakers that have been here. Uh, Wendy Selig is the Vice President of External Affairs and Strategic Alliances for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, uh, focusing on alliances with partners, corporations, foundations, trade associations, and federal agencies. She leads and coordinates the Society's Access to Care campaign and provides leadership for key collaborative efforts. She joined the Society as Managing Director in 2000 after serving 11 years as a senior house staffer on Capitol Hill. Uh, next to her is Philip Dubofsky, is the Vice President uh, Clinical Development for Vaccines at Metamune. Prior to joining Metamune, Dr. Dubofsky held several roles of increasing responsibility in support of the malaria vaccine initiative called PATH, including creating, managing, and defending a portfolio of 25 malaria vaccine candidates, spanning from early candidate optimization to phase three clinical trial preparation. Uh, he also previously served in a clinical capacity at Stanford University, University of Maryland, and Johns Hopkins University Hospitals. And next to me is the Honorable John Porter, Chairman of Research America, Vice President of the Foundation for NIH, Chairman of PBS, and a member of the Institute of Medicine and Council on Foreign Relations. He is a former trustee of the Brookings Institution and the RAND Corporation. Porter served 21 years in the U.S. House of Representatives and chaired the Appropriations Subcommittee that funded all domestic health programs and was Vice Chair of the Subcommittee that funded U.S. global health efforts. Uh, his work in Congress focused on increasing funding for health research and for public broadcasting, human rights, and development, and the environment. And he is also currently a partner in the Washington law firm Hogan and Hartson. So why don't we just start with you, Wendy, and uh, continue this discussion. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And um, that was a great presentation that Alta gave. And actually, sure. the question that was asked, I have sort of three areas that I want to talk about. And uh, as Jeff said, I work for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, which is the advocacy affiliate for the American Cancer Society. Uh, you heard from our CEO over the course of the weekend, kind of the big picture on cancer, and this issue about discoveries last mile, and how do we get, uh, how do we get everything that's out there in terms of research, uh, 
to patients. So I'm going to give you the perspective, the public policy perspective from the eyes of the patient, if I can, sort of from three areas. One is resources. One is I'll talk a little bit about what's going on in cancer. And then I want to go back to a conversation we've had a lot this weekend about access, because in all three of these areas are there barriers, but there are also opportunities for patients. So from the perspective of resources and the question that was asked uh, about how this whole process at FDA is funded, and both both the perception of, of that, which was your question, as well as the reality. And we invest as a country heavily in medical research through the NIH. Some of us, and I'm sure you'll hear from Congressman Porter in a minute, would say it's, it's not been enough, and it's not been consistently enough in terms of basic research at the NIH. Then there's the industry investment that occurs in the pharmaceutical world, ba- taking that basic research and trying to provide clinical applications for patients. But the piece that we don't talk enough about, that you don't hear enough about, is the FDA, which is such a critical sort of pathway through which all of these inventions and discoveries have to go, not just on the drug side, but also devices, screening tools. Uh, it's, so it's, it's treatments, but it's broader than that as well. And the FDA uh, has been chronically underfunded to do this work. PDUFA, which um, was mentioned by the previous speaker, is a way to try to bring user fee resources into the FDA to support this work. But that has to be balanced by a commitment by the public treasury, by federal dollars. And that portion has been traditionally underfunded. So there are two issues there. One is the perception issue. And we would say it's very important for the federal piece of that to be significant enough to balance any kind of perception problem. But it's also even more importantly important that the federal government provide enough resources for the FDA to do its job. And the FDA has been um, held up uh, in the last six months to a year, multiple times, uh, not just in the drug and device world, but for food safety and all of the other things in the mission of the FDA where people perceive that it has fallen down on its job, in large part because it doesn't have the resources to do it. None of that was ever the fault of Congressman Porter, by the way, because the FDA is not funded by the committee that he chaired. Um, the FDA is actually funded separately in the agriculture funding business. Uh, bill. So even though the FDA is a critical health agency, it gets its funding in a total, on a totally different track from the Congress. So there are a number of issues there, and if you all want to talk more about that in questions, we can uh, do that. The second thing I wanted to just spend a few minutes talking about, again, picking up where Alta left off, is the world of cancer. She talked about clinical trials and sort of the, the on-paper process of how it's supposed to work. In cancer, Uh, We have a number of challenges, not the least of which is that uh, clinical trials, which is the gold standard for how you find out about whether a drug is safe and effective for use in cancer patients, fewer than 5% of the adult cancer population enrolls in a clinical trial. So you can imagine that we're, we're studying safety and efficacy of these very important drugs to the lives of cancer patients based on a tiny platform of subjects in those trials. So we have an issue with accrual and enrollment and getting cancer patients into these trials so that we can expeditiously find out whether they are safe and effective for use as they would be labeled by the FDA. Um, And by the way, just by comparison, in childhood cancer, clinical trial is the standard of care for children. Upwards of 80% of children with cancer are treated through a clinical trial. So clinical trials are not only about discovery and testing and research and data. They're also about the standard of care for people who are currently suffering from the disease. Um, The second thing about cancer is partially because of this clinical trial problem, partially because of how complicated cancer is. It's upwards of 200 specific diseases, not just one, and not even just by body part, but within body parts there are subtypes of cancer. Uh, So a whole sort of specialty uh, in terms of off-label use of drugs, and I said this in another panel, there's nothing nefarious about that term off-label. Some people might feel like, you know, this sort of backroom kind of, you know, beaker testing of things that's not safe and shouldn't be done. It's actually the way oncology is practiced for the most part. Somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of cancer treatment today is done so-called off-label. What that means is that a particular drug that has been approved by the FDA and has a label on it for what that approval is might be used in combination with another drug or in a different way than what's indicated on the label, perhaps for a different cancer, 
Uh, and the oncologist might be, be trying that as a second or third line therapy if the front line therapy has failed. Or we may be to a point where a combination therapy is considered sort of the best practice for the front line treatment of a particular cancer. Though just, just for people's comfort, there, there is a process by which that is governed. There are compendia out there where the um, literature is published. And for example, Medicare looks at those compendia to determine whether it will pay for particular off-label uses of drugs. So um, we have this, this manner in which um, incremental knowledge about cancer treatment occurs. You, you get a drug that's been approved by the FDA for what its labeled indication is, and then you have a process out there where in real life, in practice, it's being tested in, in different ways for patient use. Um, I'll to mention compassionate use and the Abigail Alliance. I just want to say um, that is sort of hap that, that whole case happened kind of in the cancer space, so we, we were very involved in, in thinking about that. And there's a real trade-off that exists uh, between wanting to, as quickly as possible, get effective therapies to patients who are um, in a critical situation and dealing with cancer on the one hand. And on the other hand, if you go back to what I said earlier, uh, we don't want to dismantle the clinical trials infrastructure as imperfect as it currently is for cancer patients. And so there is this tension and the compassionate use policy that FDA has developed after a very long process and they've produced a, a regulatory framework, which I don't even know if it's officially final, but it is, I think, in practice what occurs, attempts to try to balance those competing interests between individual patients who very much want to, you know, they're willing to stand up and say, look, it's my body. I'm willing to take a risk that, you know, that we heard Billy Tozan yesterday talk about, you know, you're either going to die or, I forget how he said it, but he was basically presenting that, that choice that patients sometimes face. Are you going to roll the dice with a treatment that could kill you or are you going to die from your cancer? And so you can understand why an individual in that situation would be willing to say, look, I, I, I'm willing to take this risk with my body. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that you're gathering data so that we continue to build patient by patient and class of patients by class of patients so that in the future our children and their children will have more effective treatments. The last thing that I want to say um, is about access. Um, and again, this is called Discovery's Last Mile, but you know, maybe the last 100 yards of that last mile is what we've spent the whole weekend focusing on. And that is, let's say you get something all the way through this process and there's good data that says it's safe and effective and you need it if you have cancer. And what happens if you don't have insurance or if your insurance is inadequate and you can't get it? So we can't forget that part of Discovery's last mile is in the delivery system and in the insurance system for patients. And that may have to do with whether they could even be treated with it. That may have to do with whether they can afford it. Uh, we've been talking a lot about cost of healthcare reform over the last several days. One of the topics that has not been discussed as much is the individual's ability to afford their treatments. And even if you have insurance, 20% of a high number is still a high number. And so out-of-pocket costs for individual patients is something that we are very focused on in the context of healthcare reform, making sure that we say to, we say to the universal population, you have insurance, but that that insurance is adequate to cover what you might need when you get cancer. So with that, I think I'll stop. Thank you. Thanks, Philip, please. Okay. Uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on barriers to advancing new technologies and basic discoveries into, into products. And, and these basic discoveries are really, uh, where do they come from? They come from academic labs and government labs, from NIH, from the universities, um, really around the world. And the scientists that work there are excellent at solving puzzles, following the next clue, and they're rewarded for doing that with scholarly publications and, and grants uh, and, and promotions and so on. But what they're not good at is doing that next step. And that next step is really translating those basic discoveries into, into products. And that's where the product pipeline is at its widest. We have potentially um, many logs, many, many orders of magnitude more innovations which should eventually become a product. And it's whittling those down, which is a tricky bit. So there's a huge knowledge barrier up front after these basic discoveries are made because the application to the specific disease process isn't clear. So when a new discovery is made, is it going to work for lupus? Is it going to work for rheumatoid arthritis? Will it be a vaccine adjuvant? These things simply aren't clear. And history has taught us that when people think they know what they're going for, they're usually wrong, and it ends up being useful for something, something else. 
So th there's that initial huge knowledge barrier that has to be gotten over, and that can only be done really through further research and uh, iterative process. So those that understand the basic discovery don't actually necessarily understand, have the expertise or understand the disease process they're gunning for or how to apply that. They don't understand the product development path nor the regulatory quagmire they've got to weave their way through. So who does do this? And, and currently, it, it, in my mind, it lives in about four buckets. There's a large pharma, large biotech. Then there's indus industrial and developing countries, and this is done by various, think of China, India, Indonesia, Brazil. There's some up-and-coming uh, groups there who actually have this capacity to drive these products forward. And then in the last 10 years, we've seen a large effort in the U.S. around NGOs, non-government organizations, who have actually assembled teams of scientists who are able to push these products forward to the next step. So um, where this all resides in one giant bucket is in the large biotech and large pharma space. They have in-depth knowledge in all the functional areas needed to take these discoveries and actually get them to the patient in the end uh, and hopefully improve their health. Um, but um, it's tricky because uh, the large farm is not nimble. We don't know how to do things uh, cleverly or fast. What we have is a lot of horsepower. So when you throw something into the machine, we flip the switch and this giant effort goes forward. And to justify that, you have to be able to uh, understand that you're going to be able to get um, enough resources in the back end to support the effort you just invested. So I, I, there's this other thing which, which has generally been the tech transfer out of the academic and government labs to either technology companies or biotech companies. And that uh, is something that I see as a huge barrier. And the reason is that the tech transfer offices, offices in, in the government and the academic labs uh, are always trying to get as much value as possible to um, support the innovations that they've discovered. But the real value of those discoveries aren't clear. It isn't clear if you're going to need four additional bits of intellectual property to generate a product at the end. And this leads to royalty stacking, where you may need to get um, four or five different patents or five different innovations from different groups before you can develop a product. And it slows the process down. And this is a critical problem for uh, the small biotech and small uh, technology companies because they don't have time. Even if they have money, they only have, their value is only worth really you know, around their IP and the money they have in the bank. And if it takes them 10 months to negotiate licenses, they're out of business. That's too late. So there's a, there's a real disconnect between the innovation itself and the uh, technologies and, and discoveries that go with it to actually develop into a product. Yep, I think that's I'll stop. John? Let me uh, start by saying that I'm no expert in this area. Uh, I did not have FDA under my jurisdiction, as Wendy just described. It was over in the Agriculture Subcommittee on Appropriations. Tried to get it, <laughs> but there was a lot of resistance to uh, giving up that jurisdiction. And uh, so I, I, uh, I've looked at the what I see as the obstructions to uh, getting discoveries to patients. And it seems to me one of the reasons uh, is that policymakers have very little understanding of the whole uh, translational clinical research process. Uh, partly that's a result of only 4% of the House and Senate having any science background. And that, to me, is a serious, serious problem. We need more scientists to stand up and run for office. Uh, Bill Foster in Illinois ran, as a physicist, ran for the seat that was occupied by the Speaker of the House, a Republican, and won it. I think that's a good model for others. We need more scientists in public office. But even if they, even if they were there, I think there's a, a um, the, the whole enterprise is uh, kind of ill-defined, badly organized, lacks uniformity of standards and uh, transparency. And I, I don't know this firsthand, but the clinical research forum that I've had dealings with has said that it really needs to, someone needs to really look at the whole area and, and organize it much better. Uh, I know that the uh, former commissioner of um, FDA, Mark McClellan, uh, initiated the Critical Path Initiative to try to look at the whole area 
and, and the operations of the agency and see whether it can be uh, improved and they're still working on that at FDA right now. I would also look at conflict of interest policies. I think a lot of scientists are afraid of having um, ties to industry and then there's some scientists who have ties to industry that simply don't divulge them and then the science uh, that uh, results uh, gets uh, lacking in credibility and, and support because there has been uh, an evident conflict of interest between uh, industry and, and uh, science. Uh, occasionally we have fraudulent practices where uh, scientists uh, really uh, put data out there and, and uh, submit it that is uh, simply not uh, real research and, and that under, undermines the public support for science and for research and it really ought to be punished very, very severe, severely in my mind. Um, Wendy mentioned uh, the funding problem. I've suggested that maybe FDA ought to, and I asked, uh, I, I mentioned this yesterday, but I, I uh, think that Peg Hamburg ought to really look at this and see if whether we need two agencies instead of one. One, one solely on, on drugs, the other solely on the food side, because they really are in, in places where... Um, the, the, if, you're a, if you're a member of Congress and, and you're interested in science, you try to get on the, the Labor H Committee that funds NIH and, and CDC and ARC. Uh, you don't try to get on the Agriculture Subcommittee that mainly focuses on agriculture policies. And so you have, you have a, a situation where FDA is uh, funded in the Ag Committee, Ag Subcommittee, but there's very few people there that really care about FDA or really care or understand clinical research. And I think that is a serious problem. We also have some traditional, uh, in the Congress, some traditional hostility uh, among certain members uh, to the entire pharma pharmaceutical and biotech industries. Uh, they kind of uh, don't come in with, the, with an open mind about uh, working uh, with them and uh, most recently, we've seen this in a, in a um, law that was passed, Senator Kennedy initiated, and maybe you all know about this, but let me emphasize it. Reagan Udall Institute was uh, enacted into law uh, about two years ago. It sets up a, a situation of public-private partnerships where you can get government and industry to work together to get things moved along uh, this uh, critical path that we mentioned. The, it required uh, funding by the government to start it off of $500,000 uh, each year. The chairman of the Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee is absolutely opposed to this because she believes that uh, the pharmaceutical industry will use this uh, to, to advance their cause and not the public cause. So that whole thing has just stopped in its tracks. I said yesterday, uh, not, at, not, at, uh, not here in McNulty, but uh, in another uh, panel, what we really need to do in America is to get everybody together, state and local government, uh, NGOs, industry, business, get everybody at the table working together in partnerships to get things done. That's how things have been advanced in the last 30 years in this country, and we still uh, are very suspicious of the silos, and we need to work much more closely to get people working together and, uh, and solve these, these kinds of problems. So I think we should encourage public-private partnerships. Uh, you, get a, you get an intermediator, intermediary, intermediary, which is an impartial uh, convener and administrator, and that frees up the whole situation. And uh, I mentioned yesterday that my wife heads the... Uh, Foundation for NIH. Uh, that is not a regulatory agency. There are differences, but that's where you get people working together side by side uh, to, to uh, advance the cause of science, and I think it's a very, very good thing uh, for our country, and I'll stop there. Thanks, John. Um, I have several questions, but I'd love to open it up as early as possible if people have some questions. Uh, do we have some mics to go around? Or? Okay, we do have a mic coming to you. Two questions. Uh, the first one, a few years ago I read a study about hormone replacement therapy that said that it increases a cancer risk, but it seems like it's still, we're still doing lots of hormone replacement therapy. So I'd like to understand that. 
Uh, the second one, my wife said last night when in the hotel room there was an advertisement for drugs for depression, and it said, if you're already taking a drug, why don't you add this one to the mix and ask your doctor about it? So I'd like to understand a little bit about advertising in the drug industry and where we're headed there. Well, I'll, I'll take a shot. Um, and, and we may have others in the room, actually, who can, who can help... Uh, help me with this, because I don't have a science background. I have a public policy background, and so I rely very much on the bright minds um, at the American Cancer Society. Uh, with regard to the hormone replacement therapy, there was a, obviously a, a lot of media and publicity, uh, I think it was within the last couple of years, as people started to understand um, the unintended consequences of something that was pretty widely recommended and used by women, um, and a lot of discussion about potential unintended risk of cancer. And I believe since that time, uh, many women in working with their doctors have opted not to pursue that course. And organizations like the American Cancer Society have commented on, on, the, on the studies and have encouraged women to work with their doctors and to discuss the potential risks, uh, weighing that against the potential benefits. But, but I think that there was some pretty clear data about this unintended consequences. I don't think anybody set out to sort of, you know, sabotage women and say that if, if you do this, you will, you will have this problem. Phyllis Greenberger is here, and so uh, maybe she could get the mic and help me out with that one. Just, just as that's happening, let me comment on your second question about advertising, because there, there is a big discussion about that that happens in Washington, the direct-to-consumer advertising that occurs. Um, there are a whole host of issues that are being discussed about um, how best to, to deal with, the again, the tension that exists between individuals who want to take their own care in their own hands and be armed with information, and whether that's television advertising or wh whether that's information you can find on the Internet. Um, you know, on the one hand, we are encouraging consumers to know as much as they can, to go into their doctors with their files, and, and to be an active participant in their care. On the other hand, I think that there's a legitimate discussion about what's an appropriate advertisement on television, how do you, how do you get this information out to consumers in a way, and I think in the provider community there's some discussion about patients who come in and say, well, I saw this ad, or I saw this thing online, and I don't care what you, my doctor, say to me, I want this drug, and so I think there's a legitimate debate and I think Billy Tozan talked about the importance of self-regulation in the industry, and I think some of these things are starting to happen, even without legislation or regulation. But it's a very, it's a very active discussion that's going on right now. And, I, and I'll say, I'll take off my ACS hat for a second and just say, as a parent of young children, I have some questions about some of the things that you see on television that are, that are in advertisement form that may be inappropriate for young children, uh, for some of the you know, erectile dysfunction drugs. So I think there's all kinds of discussion going on. So I don't know if that answers your question. Phyllis, I've talked long enough for you to have the mic. <laughs> okay. um, well, I, I know that I realize this is not a, a panel on hormone replacement therapy, so I'm not going to belabor it. But, but let me just say that that initial information has been proven to be mostly incorrect. And that, in fact, um, and there's going to be a lot more information coming out. A lot of people are working on this, that it does not cause cancer. Um, and the, the, uh, the first results really have been adjudicated and, and segmented by population and by age. And hopefully it will be coming out that that's, that's not accurate. And if you want more information, I'll be happy to talk to you. I don't want to, you know, bore the, everybody here on, on all the details on, 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 on the risks and benefit, you know, for individual women and conditions. But so having said that, there's a lot of things, issues that, that you've op opened up on uh, Congressman Port. I mean, the whole issue of conflict of interest, I think, has gotten totally out of control. And while it's important, obviously, that people um, uh, say that whether they're getting funding and to do clinical trials or work with a company or not, it's gone so far to the other extreme that everybody's afraid to have any relationship whatsoever. And we've been talking about public-private partnerships for years now, and you can't have them if everybody's afraid that Senator, you know who was going to call them up to the hill, and, and or have an article written uh, in the paper about the fact which which undermines the research that's being done and the company that's funding it. So, I think that's a real problem, and that we've really gone way to to the other extreme. I'm wondering about the Radol, the Reagan uh, Udall, because I'm also working on that. Whether you personally have spoken to the chairwoman. Um, because I have, and there's really only one person that's holding that up, um, which is sort of ridiculous, um, and, and, and why it's gone on so long. And have you actually spoken 
to the chair of that committee, and has she heard from you? Would, I, I think I, that I would be important. I would to speak uh, with her, and I'd be happy to do that, but uh, I don't know that that would do any good. She's pretty hard uh, wired on this. Well, I think it might, because I had a conversation with her not too long ago, so I think it might be helpful. I, uh, I also agree with you that the, the whole question of conflict of interest is out of hand, and what we simply need is some kind of a transparency, maybe a national registry, where everybody simply divulges their relationships so that they're all there for everyone to see. I agree. I mean, it used to be that you you just you, you just disclosed that before you gave your presentation or whatever. Now it's basically an admission of guilt, and, 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 and people just don't take what you've said yeah. seriously. So yeah. I think it's very unfortunate. More questions? Mine would just be a comma specific question. Uh, when it comes to phase one, phase two, phase three type of clinical trials, there's a lot of rigor and standardization in what is done so that it doesn't matter where the clinical trial is done, even if it's done in developing countries, there is an understanding of what the methodologies are, the, the stop and go criteria are very clear. But when it comes to the post-registration type of research, the access and delivery research that is done after that period, there are no clear guidelines, there are no clear methodologies, the start and go, uh, in, uh, this, the whole area hasn't been managed properly. And I think, I personally feel that we are reaching a stage of irresponsibility if we don't start to see how we can structure, manage, and make sure that we teach properly that area of research so that the same quality of, 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 of undertaking follows through the whole chain. Otherwise, I think it's not only just broken, but it's poorly managed as well. Um, you know, the last 100 years of medicine has mostly been about chemistry, and we're moving forward into an area where we might be able to deliver something. And so I'm just wondering to what extent the FDA and the other agencies that need to be involved have really um, been able to rethink how we're going to do clinical trials, um, because, you know, it's just a whole different set of circumstances. We'll never be able to know exactly where every single cell goes, you know, when it goes into the body. And so I wanted to know, in terms of, since this is about going from the lab to the bedside, what are the obstacles that still exist? So, I mostly do vaccines, so I'm into biologics. So it's not the drug side, it's the biologic side. And I deal with CBER um, um, every week. This last H1N1, I've been dealing with them every day. And at the same time, you know, I have experience in Australia and Europe with the national bodies in China in Australia and India. And the thing I'd like to get across is the only thing worse than the FDA is not having the FDA. And the reason why is it's really the only regulatory body in the world that will work with you. So they, uh, the other regulatory bodies, you develop your file and then you kind of throw it over the wall and they say yes or no. But the FDA has a process, a structured process, where they will work with you along the entire development process to help guide you and make sure that you don't get to the end without having an unknown barrier around them. Now, I've been involved in a couple of cases where novel technologies that have never been in people and the function wasn't clear how it was going to work came to them. And, you know, they've shown flexibility. But what was said earlier, I guess I'd like to echo, is that you know, they don't have the resources right now. And that actually pushes them to go into a less thoughtful and more conservative position. So what the guidance you get is, is um, more slow, et cetera, and it's, and it's not the one where if you applied all the science that you could wrap your brain around that you could get to a different position. And I guess the other thing to understand is the FDA is not only a bunch of regulators, they have research labs there as well. So they, there are scientists there who understand exactly what's going on, who can uh, bring that knowledge to bear onto the regulatory process. If I could just add one thing, which is I think that because the FDA has taken a lot of public criticism lately and because its resources are diminished, 
the other potential problem that we're getting into is it's not attracting enough of the really bright minds who want to go into that kind of work, who are on the cutting edge, who are willing to go and be a public servant and work for the government. You know, so I think these things tend to snowball. The, the agency has, has been a punching bag for a while, and I think the new leadership there is, you know, part of that is to try to sort of raise the spirits. Um, you know, so you start to have morale issues, you start to have other issues, they don't have the resources. So I think, I think that all of us, you know, we advocate on behalf of the FDA and its resources from the perspective of patients because we know how important it is to the continuum of research and getting better therapies to patients. So I think that that's another issue as science is changing, um, and, you know, and as we're exploring biologics and molecularly targeted therapies for cancer and all those kinds of things, we're going to need to keep being able to attract people into those jobs to do exactly what was just described. A lot of the, excuse me, a lot of the uh, clinical trials are being done abroad now. How does the FDA deal with these? So for us, all of our trials are done both under FDA and whichever national body they're being done in. So the same standard applies. I wonder if uh, you have any thoughts about how we can move into a precision regulatory environment that's sort of compatible with the era of precision or personalized medicine. Uh, one sort of uh, personal experience, I'm involved in the Sentinel Initiative, the FDA Sentinel Initiative, mm -hmm. which was started a couple of years ago in reaction to the Vioxx sort of problems and the idea is to local and claim space, any source of data you can get to identify patient risk factors earlier. Um, and after the sort of initial tests, one of the things they pointed out is we designed these tests very carefully so that we wouldn't learn anything we didn't already know. And the reason was our only regulatory recourse is to, you know, issue a black label or some sort of broadcast warning of risk factors. And we're not confident yet whether these new methods are accurate, um, which is a fair point when you're studying. But on the other hand, the, the real issue is, well, if you can't precisely target warnings to that very small subset of patients that actually have the risk factors, what do you do? So in Vioxx's case, there's a relatively small number of patients that actually have significant risk factors, but their only recourse was to pull it from the market entirely, which means there's a lot of people who could benefit from that drug who can't because of the imprecision of the regulatory environment. So I'm wondering if we can just change the model away from three phases of trials, put it on the market, do sort of post-market surveillance, serious adverse event reporting kind of model to something where you blur the lines between clinical trials, post-market surveillance, uh, medication adherence, where you have real-time connections with patients and doctors, and it's more of a decision support information propagation tool as opposed to regulators saying who can have what drugs. I, I think to a certain degree there is slow motion in, in that direction. And certainly with one of my last uh, vaccines that, I, that was brought to market, you know, the post-marketing studies are, are vast. There are over 100,000 children. So, and that's plugged into a, a, a system where you can gather the healthcare data about them actively through a, through a large um, you know, managed uh, HMO. So that's exactly the kind of thing I, I think would answer the questions that, that, that you're saying, and, and therefore the regulators could tailor um, the, um, the label to, uh, to the problems that are seen. But you know, that's not, that's, that's, it, there are a couple problems. One is it means that the drug is available to the, mar to the market and to people before the exact risks have been defined. And I think that's always been the case, but in this case you're bringing it out because you're continuing studies after uh, licensure. Uh, and the other problem is that if you start talking about studies that are hundreds of thousands of patients large, it starts becoming a, a resource constraint, and those are difficult to manage and to do well. Uh, first, I, a comment and a question. The comment is uh, panelists for their excellent discussions, and I thank Congressman Porter. I'm a president of the American Association of Advancement of Science, and I think the audience real, has to realize that this congressman was the individual every year singled out as being the most beneficial to the causes of American science. Quest, question has to do with a, an idea I have. Uh, the, one of the blocks, of course, with the new medications is the cost. Once they're finally brought to the public, the statins are one of the most widely prescribed drugs out there. And the, anyone like myself who takes these realizes they cost thousands of dollars per year. And the pharmaceutical companies always argue that 
because of regulatory delays, they need to recover their costs by having exceedingly high prices and refuse to negotiate prices. Is a possible way to get through this a method where we could possibly extend patent lives in exchange for negotiated drug pricing so the pharmaceutical companies would have a stable platform, not looking to recover costs in the next year or two years or three years, but over five or ten years? Is this a, ra a reasonable proposal? on my side of the business, but I'm happy to talk about anything, basically. I mean, it, I, I think patent, <laughs> patent extension is always something which is appealing to, the, to, to industry because it means that your revenue is, is more or less assured, and that means that there's less risk uh, in, in what's going to happen in, in X number of years, and that allows you to take more risk in the development side. The, you know, the, the cost to develop a new drug are, are very, very high, uh, and you know, what's the real cost? Who knows? Uh, half a billion, uh, $750 million perhaps, depending on what the drug is. Um, some are cheaper and some are more expensive. It really depends what the indication and the populations that you have to study the drugs in. So to, to make sure that we can continue to do this kind of research and bring new medicines in, we have to be able to support that entire effort somehow. So I, I, I think that probably people would be quite happy to have extended patents. I think the tricky part is how you would negotiate the price down on the far side because the whole patent expiry part allows competitors to come to the market and therefore drive the price down. So there's a, there has to be some sort of a balance there. Well, and these issues are being, you know, as we sit here, hotly debated on the biologic side as part of health care reform in the Congress with the whole question of how long is the protection going to be for a brand name biologic before generics or biosimilars can come onto the market. So they're having this exact debate about cost, and about recouping cost and about innovation and orphan drugs and uh, you know all of these issues on the biologic side right now and it's coming as part of healthcare reform so it's coming with that sort of overlay of cost to patients cost to the system and you know I think that the basic theory that most people have is that there should be some protection there has to be enough incentive how much is enough and then at some point there has to be an ability for open competition and that that competition will lead to the reduction in cost. I haven't heard the sort of quid pro quo that you described. I mean, I know the issue of negotiated prices has also been hotly debated in Medicare, but I haven't, I haven't heard that, you know, would you be, would, and there are some industry folks in the room and maybe they could comment more than I can about the viability of what you've suggested. Regarded as a win-win, and I have brought this to the attention of a number of pharmaceutical executives, and, and they were very pleased. They sell drugs in Europe and Canada, and every month they're in the offices of the health ministers negotiating the prices. And I, I think it is a way around this kind of wins. Did you, did you ask Billy Tozan when he was here? No, no, no I, didn't. I didn't. Well, it seems to me that you always need a vehicle to change your policy, and the vehicle that you have is, is health care reform right now. Mm -hmm. So you need somebody up on the hill in the right place saying, we should do this and get people thinking about it. And I don't know where you've gone in that process, but we... We're, we're seeing the train beginning to leave the station. It's time to uh, try to jump on, I think. My name is Elizabeth Kittry, and I'm in uh, the HHS Secretary's Office where I coordinate innovation issues, and I also sit on a uh, White House a working group on innovation issues. And I'd like to get your thought on public policy solutions to two of the challenges. That one has to do with the accrual rate in uh, clinical trials. You talked about how only 5% of cancer patients are enrolled in clinical trials. And the other issue was the tech transfer process, and you mentioned that that's taking far too long. Both are true, and I'd like your thoughts on public policy solutions um, from HHS or any of the other agencies that are, um, have a stake in this. Thanks. I'll take the one to start on the tech transfer. Uh, you know, we in our policy shop and working with our science folks and medical folks have been looking at this clinical trials problem for a long time. Um, ACS, as an organization that provides information to the public, spends a good amount of its own resources trying to help accrue patients into trials uh, and to provide a matching service. So there are things that can be done outside of government. Um, doctors need to be knowledgeable about what's going on. They need to refer their patients into trials. There are some barriers there. It's, you know, some physicians want, you know, they're not conducting the trial in their own clinical setting. They want to c maintain contact with their patients, so there are those issues. Um, what we have focused on to date, which um, admittedly is not 
the silver bullet, but is, is one barrier, and that has to do with the out-of-pocket costs for patients. Um, and we have systematically been working first with Medicare and then around the country in states uh, to ensure that insurance companies will pay for the routine patient care costs when an individual enrolls in a trial. And many insurance companies and many insurance plans to date will consider that to be an experimental therapy. And while the cost of the trial itself is usually paid for by the, the industry or whoever's conducting the trial, that patient doesn't just suddenly stop having other medical costs because they're in a trial that are perhaps unrelated to the direct uh, trial study. So we've been successful around the country in um, dozens of states in, in making that a mandate uh, for insurers. It's the policy under Medicare that routine costs are provided. There is a federal bill um, to, to do that in, um, in the, the plans that are regulated by the federal government. But admittedly, that's not the whole part of the problem. There are other barriers, and, and we would welcome working with HHS and anyone else to figure out how we can enhance accrual into, into clinical trials for cancer patients. Yeah, the, the, the tech transfer thing is a bit tricky. I, I think one option might be to uh, reward those technologies that actually lead to success. So if you dumped um, upfront and milestone payment and just took a royalty, then perhaps you know, if, if that technology fails as it goes forward, there would be no um, penalty, if, if you will. But if it succeeds, then there would be benefit to the inventors and, and you know, justifiably to the, to the people who do it. So that's, that's one thought, but it's, it's really the, the time and the um, effort it takes to negotiate the license up front, which I see as being a huge barrier, especially when you're talking about the small, nimble biotech companies that can get the job done. They can move it to the next stage, and if those companies are burdened with um, agreements back to, their, uh, to the inventors of initial property, then they're not going to be able to move that to the next step, to the next guys who can actually commercialize it. Um, so, you know, that's... That's, I think, a realization that's an issue and maybe some lighter gloves in that respect. Understanding that perhaps the government will be willing to take uh, not monetary return for public good that could come from these inventions. The, uh, Elizabeth, the only uh, experience I've had in, in, is in respect to the NIH Tech Transfer Office that takes intramural uh, discovery or intellectual property and tries to work with industry to get that out. And I would, I would urge you to look at what policies are followed there uh, and try to focus them on, on uh, what is best for the patient out there and how, how you can work with, uh, with uh, industry to move that along the path of, of further uh, applied research and discovery uh, that will get to the market and get there quickly. There's obviously a lot more questions still. We're out of time, unfortunately. Maybe if you guys have a little time, we can come up for questions. I just want to thank the panelists, Wendy, Philip, John, and, of course, Alta, uh, for coming. Thank you.